When you try to be a one-stop shop, you need to take care of many different boxes where you need to be very good at it all in order to create at the end like a smooth run-through from collection to the experience that the customer now opening the SaaS platform with the 3D model gets at the end. You have to be very, very conservative. You have to keep focused very narrowly on what you want to achieve because you don't have margins of mistake. If you are making the wrong bet when you're bootstrapping, if you don't have so much capital behind you, that makes all of the business in danger. I think there should be a straight line between what AI would be allowed to recommend and to do and the things that are left to us, people that are actually going to live with the consequence to make. Hi everybody, welcome to the Devico Breakfast Bar. Here we speak with different people involved in the business landscape, share their expertise, delve into the latest tech trends and explore the ins and outs of IT outsourcing. I'm Oleg Sarikov and today I'm excited to have Avi Afalo, founder and CEO at Simplex 3D. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss new episodes. Hi Avi and thanks for joining me today. Hi Oleg, I'm happy to be here, thanks for having me. Let's start our podcast with a little blitz. I start a sentence and you continue. Okay, let's do it. Entrepreneurship gave me... The freedom to think independently. Entrepreneurship deprived me... More time with the family. My main superpower is... Understanding people. My main weakness is... Overthinking some aspects of the business, maybe. When I'm afraid, I... I'm consulting with friends. What inspired you to start Simplex 3D back in 2013? Was there a particular problem or you were determined to solve? Well, our names kind of indicates on the problem that we try to solve or what we try to achieve. Simplex was the idea of taking something complex and make it more simple. So we've been working in this industry of aerial survey and data production for a while before. And we found the procedures to be very difficult and complex to do. And we try to figure out a way to do it simpler, it's much more simple. Simplex is basically the idea of taking something complex and make it more simple. I think that was the drive and still maybe the main force for us of like when we think about our products and offering. Bootstrapping Simplex 3D in 2013 must have come with its own set of challenges. What were some of the hurdles you faced and what kept you motivating during these years? Bootstrapping is a rough route to take. Even when you're finance, it's difficult. So it's more difficult when you're bootstrapping. There's many obstacles to face. You have to be very, very conservative. You have to keep focus very narrowly on what you want to achieve because you don't have margins of mistake. If you are making the wrong bet when you're bootstrapping, if you don't have so much capital behind you, like your own wealth, which we didn't have, that makes all of the business in danger. So you need to be very, very focused, very, very towards your target, and you need to be able to do a lot of things you are on your own. So you're not gonna get the best expert in the beginning to do your social media, or you're not gonna get the best engineer for your design, and you'll need to figure out within the team how do you handle all of these obstacles and how do you get it off the ground? And I think that's the most difficult part. The first couple of years, but when it's still uncertain, you don't get still the market feedback that you're looking for and you need to believe. I mean, the team needs to go forward and believe and understand that there will be hurdles, but they believe in their power to overcome them. And you need to be also very attentive to the market, right? I mean, you need to get the signals from the market and understand, are you going in the right direction? Because again, you cannot afford yourself to go into a route which is not the right one for you when you bootstrap no there's not a lot of routes that you can take which would not lead you to the goal so be attentive to the market and you have to move slowly that's in setback you need to go slowly get the indications that you're on the right path and move forward with a lot of belief in what you do i think that's the main thing Simplex 3D is described as a one-stop shop, 3D map, data and workspace what were the biggest technical or organizational hurdles in building such an integrated SaaS solution? I mean, here there's a lot of disciplines that we needed to gather together and put into one place. It started with data collection, where we've developed the world's most efficient, high-resolution data collection unit, which we can put on any aircraft. So the data collection part is very difficult, and you need to 
get that very streamlined and very efficient. Second thing is data processing. So many different disciplines that needs to be put together in order to create that one-stop shop, right? So we need to be able to take hundreds of thousands of images and create a 3D model of a city out of that. And then we also went into the GIS 3D world where we wanted to make all of this data streamable, accessible, synchronized with real-time data and keeping very smooth user experience so our end customers would be able to work with the data because it's not enough only to collect it. So this combination of very different disciplines into one company, which is not huge, that's maybe the organizational and technical issues that you need to take care of because there's like three or four different elements. And now with AI, the last part we've embedded into solution, you have talents on all of them. Talents in the engineering or the hardware scale, the software development, the SaaS part. How do you stream so much data that would work smoothly on the web? That's a big, big question. How do you manage all of your users that are entering together to the same platform and you allow performance? When you try to be a one-stop shop, you need to take care of many different boxes where you need to be very good at it all in order to create at the end like a smooth run through from collection to the experience that the customer now opening the SaaS platform with the 3D model gets at the end. How do you balance long-term vision with short-term execution? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a hard one, I think. The long-term vision of us is very ambitious, I would say. We want Simplex 3D to be the workspace where all urban decisions are basically being made on the private sector and also on the government side. Working in Israel, we are working with 70 or 80 percent with the government market here, but also with 70 or 80 percent of the private market. On one hand, you need to plan the system to be able to withhold scale. On the long term, you want everyone to work on the same data and collaborate between them different types of information. But on the short term, you have to make the system user-friendly, accessible with the data right away. So there's always some kind of tension between your end goal and what you can provide right now. One more example is the AI part, which we are slowly embedding into the platform as the solution. We have a vision to make everything much more automatic, all of the data accessible much faster. In the short term, you need to get the things that are actually working well and get them started and then move on to the longer term of the vision of how you see it progresses in two or three years from now. What's your approach to business development in a market where public and private sectors intersect so heavily? Yeah, so this is actually part of our strategy because we think we are enabling to create a joint canvas, like a joint playground where officials, the private sectors and the public can actually understand and review the data much better than before. So our approach is actually to go and try to sell our products to both. It slowly become like an ecosystem where now the city that approves the project sees the same work on the same platform as the architect that is now uploading his architectural model into the urban context and the broker at the end that would sell it, right? So basically when they all work on the same environment, this makes everyone's job much more seamlessly, less friction between them, much more understanding between what the developer wants to achieve, how the city sees in the project with their concerns, but when they all look at the same canvas and work with the same data, that really makes much more collaborative space and basically reduce friction. So we see projects that can move faster and we see better buildings, better design, and at the end of the day, better apartments that are sold to the end customers. So this is very good point where once this ecosystem is built together, it creates much better force, like much better value to both ends of the business. Industries like real estate regulation and public interest play a major role. How do you balance AI-driven efficiency with the need for human oversight and accountability? The AI we use is not meant to replace humans in the loop. It's going to help them. It's going to help them get and extract information faster. It's going to make them understand the data better. It's, our AI, what it does is basically understand each part of the city and give it like a label. So we know what's a building, what's a window, what's a street, what's a street lamp, all of the features inside the city. And also going lifting through dozens of documents relating real estate zoning, for example. That now you can extract and show what can be built on the lot, right? Which before would have taken days of work and now can be done in one search on our platform. So it's a decision support for decision makers. It's not going to change how, at the end of the day, humans are making the right decisions for the projects, for the city, for the citizens. But it would definitely help them make much more work, much faster, 
and much more efficiently with less mistakes because what AI enables you to do is actually create much, much faster and smarter decisions. It's not going to change the decisions, it's just going to improve the decisions. AI ethics and bias are hot topics, especially in systems that impact real communities. What do you think about ethical AI in the context of planning, housing and urban development? Yes, I think it's an important conversation to make. I think ethical AI in general is very important and the sense of all of our life decisions that are going to be changed dramatically in the next few years. On our side, we are actually trying to keep the AI on things that are more quantitative and what not quality. So the AI doesn't decide which neighborhood is better in a sense or which building design should be the one that would be chosen. It gives you more numerical and negative information in order for you to make the right ethical decision that is made on the principles that you live by. We are not aiming to go in, to take the AI into that space that would decide, should I need to invest in this neighborhood or that? Because I think that's the line where people would still need to make the decisions, on, more so on planning, on things that, you know, affect a lot of people in the city. And in general, I think there should be a strict line between what AI would be allowed to recommend and to do and the things that are left to us, people that are actually going to live with the consequence to make. So we are putting a very distinct line between the two. What emerging AI technologies are you most excited about? Yeah, so I think there's two things. One is the ability to understand the city better. When the AI algorithm now detects features in the city and we can aggregate them and ask questions about them, it makes planning much better and you can get that information so much faster than before. The second thing is there's so much information around us which is very hard to uh, first to find, to search, and secondly to understand. And I think the AI could do amazing work on sifting through these enormous data sets that we have around us. Just one example, we work in New York City. In New York City, there is like the zoning law that has, I don't know, 2,000 pages of information. You need dozens of experts to understand exactly what's allowed and not, what's not allowed to build in a specific lot, for example, with a lot of rules that overlay one each other. You need to tell, go to lawyers and you need to go to experts and you need to get an opinion and second opinion and so on. Now with the AI, it doesn't solve 100% of the issues, of course, but it could solve 70-80%. So 70 or 80% now can go through by a simple query asking the right questions on our AI tool, going through a thousand documents of zoning laws and extracting what you need right away. So it's really a multiple power addition, it's a turbo to your engine. You can do much more work, much more efficient and much faster than before. And we're just in the early steps of what the AI would be able to do for us. So we are very excited to see if things go forward, show what you can build on a lot, show how it would look like later on, do the, some of the renderings and the imagery automatically that you don't need to do it manually anymore. It's all coming and it's not years away, it's months away. So that's very, very exciting to see. We discussed AI and now I would like to talk about humans. Without humans, we're not going to live in the foreseeable future, no matter what happens in AI. Are there specific regions or countries that you find particularly promising for the tech talent? First, we come from Israel, and there's a lot of talent and innovation at home so that we can use. But, you know, we've found amazing talents and partners around the world. We work in Italy, the UK, Portugal, and of course the US. And we have different partners on all spectrum. We need to bring them as part of the team. And I think that's the main challenge. How do you get teams that are offshore to be part of your team, not just like a, a vendor or a client, but really a part of your vision. And I think the way to do it is give them clarity on what you do now, what's your vision to the future, and see how they can contribute their talent into contributing to, to complete this vision. And I think there's so much talent everywhere. And sometimes even different people from different countries and cultures see things differently in a way that they can come up with solutions that are only possible to find when you look at the problem from their end. That diversity of talents for different locations, different approaches, creates much more integrated solutions and a much more powerful way for us to move forward. How do you see the role of IT outsourcing evolving in the context of your industry? We actually don't like really the word outsourcing. 
it's not like throwing something outside and get it there in the end. We like it more like a distributed team or offshore team that work with us together. And in IT is similar to, I think, to others. I mean, the second you get the IT teams to understand the entire part of your company vision, not just like a small section, I want you to solve this problem and that's it, then it's evolving to be a much better partnership, not right someone that you hire for do one job and that's it. Once the people understand the complexity of the business and they also come up with some suggestions sometimes that we haven't thought of, right? Like I can help the business here and here as well, not just that link that you thought that you can get a value of. And that's really, we found it to be very effective when people understand the total overall look of the company and then it comes from them. Now I can make this faster for you. I can make that more efficient and the role becomes even more deep than just an IT, for example. How do you see the alignment between your company's vision and where your offshore teams are heading? How do you align this? I think it starts with context. You don't give them like a ticket to solve. You give them the problem with the context of how this problem lives inside the entire ecosystem of what the company is doing. And we onboard external team, full-time hires. It's all about the deep dive into the product vision, into the problem, into the friction that the system has. And then this really make everyone align with your goal. And I think in general, in management, that's something that you need to keep on your company. How do you keep everyone aligned on the same goal and the same vision? And when people are offshore, it's even more needed for them to understand the vision and the end goal to become part of the team. And I think that's the main thing. Once they become part of the team, it doesn't really matter anymore if they are offshore or here. We are now living in an era where people are working remotely anyway. So the team cohesive and feeling like a team doesn't come from sitting in the same room every day. It comes from the same vision, the same goal, from understanding what you're trying to achieve together. So the outsourced IT teams or the distributed teams, as we like to call them, are the same. Once they are part of the team, it's all aligned. The problems solved by themselves. As we wrap up our conversation, what advice would you give to companies considering IT outsourcing dedicated teams, offshore teams, but concerned about losing control over their technology projects? And actually, there is the contracts that keep the IP safe and all of that. That's on the technical side, and I think that's solved. But my advice is always about sharing context and collaboration. Once you achieve this level of collaboration, the offshore team sees and aligns with your goals, these concerns will be history. You're not going to have these concerns anymore because you will feel these guys are part of your team. You need to get to that level as fast as you can where the team feels is part of the company and the company feels that the team is part of the group as well. And the way for me at least to do it is by sharing whatever you can, sharing the broader context, sharing the vision, sharing the problems, sharing the successes. Treat it as one group and then you don't feel that you lose control. You feel that you just have more control and more strength in other parts of the world. Avi, thanks for your time. Thanks for a very interesting conversation. Really, I enjoyed speaking with you. I hope my audience will do the same. I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you very much, Oleg. It was a pleasure talking with you. If you enjoy our discussion and want to stay updated on the future episodes, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you will not miss out on the latest insights and conversations from the Levico Breakfast Bar. See you in the next episode.